Well, Superstar April here is eight, comes to you live from London. So it's my great pleasure, my great pleasure, to introduce April Edwards. She is our senior cloud advocate. And uh, when she's, what did you start with the company and you, you reached out to me or you've been with the company? I met Jeffrey uh, two and a half years ago on behalf of a friend named Abel Wang, the late Abel Wang, mm. if any of you have heard his name. I was recording at the DevOps lab. I rewrote my technical demo in Bash because I wanted to be more dev, because I came from an ops background. I'm on the DevOps lab, so I'm gonna be more dev. So I wrote it in Bash, and Abel's like, I'm a PowerShell guy. I'm like, yeah, I need to do this in PowerShell, but I'm too nervous, not gonna change it. We do the recording, it was great. And he goes, let's go have lunch with Jeffrey Snover. And so I met Jeffrey, and Abel said, tell Jeffrey what you did today. So I had to admit to Jeffrey that I did not use PowerShell in my demo that over 50,000 people have seen on YouTube. But I, since that day, always use PowerShell and won't revert because I think PowerShell is more than awesome dev. And did I bash shame you? You did not bash shame me. I did not me. bash shame you. You because, accepted me because for Because I accepted you for you are. But also because it's about you guys. It's about the tools to make you successful. It's not about any particular technology. Anyway, it's my great honor uh, to introduce the firecracker that is April Edwards who's going to talk to you about DevOps. Thank you, Jeffrey. I want to thank all of you for being here today. It's been a solid two and a half years that we've been locked away. So I am April Edwards. I'm the DevOps practice lead in advocacy. I'm a senior cloud advocate. What does that mean? I teach all of you about the cloud and DevOps and cool stuff. I worked in operations for over 25 years, and I moved into the development side at Microsoft and Engineering. And now I'm an advocate because I love writing code. I love teaching people about it and doing cool stuff. So I actually, as Jeffrey said, sit in the UK. So I'm visiting here, very jet lagged, eight hours behind where I'm sitting, so if I accidentally fall asleep, I'm sorry. So I wanna ask each and every one of you, how do you define DevOps? Go ahead and shout it out. We've been locked away for two and a half years, now is your time to come out of your shell. How would you define DevOps? Automation of ops. Come on, do we need more coffee? All right, so if I were to ask each and every one of you, I'll get a very different answer. Depends on our backgrounds, where we've been, what our experiences are, what our interactions have been with developers, operational teams, et cetera. So before we go into defining DevOps, I want to go ahead and watch a little video. So grab some popcorn, grab a coffee, and we're going to go ahead and watch this little video for a couple minutes. But Holland comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change tires. Lou Moore himself changes the tires. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's a tense time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. Tires are changed at last. A crewman polishes the windshield as Holland moves away just 67 seconds after he stops. That was fast. So the reason why I love showing this video, because this is DevOps. This exemplifies the DevOps mentality and what we're trying to achieve. Looking at that first part of the video, four people were working on that car, four. 
Now, thinking back many years ago, we used to walk into that data center to deploy an application with something on a USB stick. We'd physically walk up to that server, plug it in, and to get our application installed, we'd change things. And it was me, myself, and I making those configuration changes to get that application working. So if we think about our legacy applications, how we did things, we look at the first video, four people. Now when we work on applications and our infrastructures, everyone else is involved. It's no longer just you as the solo person, we have entire teams. Multiple changes to get an app running were one thing, now we have entire teams. We have our developers, our operational teams, we have PMs, we have DBAs, we have testers, we have security folks. Everyone wants access to the project and what we're deploying. And now most of the time, developers don't even have access to the infrastructure that they're deploying to. So when I talk about, when I look at Melbourne and what they're doing now, this exemplifies the tooling. Our tooling has completely changed over the years in how we deploy things. We have infrastructure as code. We have continuous automation, continuous delivery, and we can deliver software and infrastructure faster than ever before. We've gone from using a hammer, who saw the hammer? Yeah, yeah. to an air wrench, okay? We have changed our tooling. We've completely redone how we deploy these applications out. So if you look at the top, there's a guy at the top, you don't see his head, actually there's two guys at the top, doing absolutely nothing. What do you think they're doing? Timing it, yes. They're monitoring the entire situation to see how they can do that even faster. They're looking to reiterate that process faster and faster and faster. Now we have the guy in the back with the jack. We got a guy behind him with a second jack. Why do we have a second jack? Because they know how critical that is to their process, and they know they've failed. They can't afford that failure, so they have someone there. So we need to protect ourselves from the instances that hurt. So how do we define DevOps at Microsoft? We define DevOps as the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. And I wanna focus on this word value. Because we need everyone in our organization to align to a single goal to deliver that value. I don't care if you're shipping software, code, infrastructure, are you delivering value? We need to incentivize our teams to deliver that value. So think of how you work today, probably in a very siloed environment. We have our ops team and our development team. As an ops person, I'm incentivized to keep the lights on 24 by seven. If I don't keep those lights on, I'm either A, out of job, or I don't get my incentivization. As a developer, I am tasked to deliver new features and new code so that our end users are happy. And I am tasked to make as many changes as possible. Those don't align. So we need to align those two teams, break down those barriers. So who cares about DevOps? It's a word, great. Your competition's already doing it. Think of your Ubers, your Netflix, your Domino's pizza. I ordered a lot of pizza during lockdown, like a lot of pizza. I ordered that pizza. I could see it beginning and end. I knew exactly when it was gonna come. Why did I care? because I could put on pants. <laughs> but we need to be able to increase our velocity, reduce our downtime, and reduce our human error. And as operational people, we're good at human error. Like, I can't even type my name without an issue, so I need to DevOps what I do in my day-to-day -day life. We have stats to talk about why and how DevOps companies, high-performing DevOps companies are achieving this. So our, what do our management teams care about? Faster time to market and increased revenue. But as a high-performing organization, we know we can do more frequent deployments. We have faster time from commit to deploy. Now, as an ops background, we had a lot of incidences. If I can recover faster from my incidences over 6,500 times faster, that incentivizes me. We also know that we have a third lower failure change rate in our organization. People change is the hardest change in DevOps. We have to have buy-in from the top of the organization all the way down. It's a massive cultural shift in our organizations. Everyone within an organization must continue, focus on that continuous delivery of value. Everyone needs to be involved. So we need people involved and their roles. They're not jobs. So we talk about the DevOps process. We kind of talk about it in a four-stage cycle. We have the planning phase, development phase, delivery, operation. We want to be able to innovate fast yet still deliver code and infrastructure of high quality and of the highest quality. We need to plan out how we're going to do that in our planning phase. Developers work in sprints, and I know most of us here in the ops background, sprints aren't such a bad thing, and we might need to think about embracing it. We need to check in our code, check in our changes. We need to be able to develop and write our code and track it, because if I make a change to my file and someone overwrites it, I'm gonna be pissed. 
We need to kick off automation in our delivery. We need to deliver that with CICD, continuous integration, continuous delivery. And then that operational phase. That operational phase is huge. How do we hook in monitoring? How do we observe what we've just done? Because we are going to have an outage, so we need to see that. We have this term in DevOps we call shifting left. We do things early and often, and we fail fast, just like my first marriage. So we have sources of vulnerabilities, and now we want to shift our security left. We want to do everything earlier on in the process. We know there's a cost associated to remediation in production. How many of you have found errors in production and lost your job? I have. No one? Okay. Cool. How many of you have experienced a security breach in your organization? The cost to organizations is absolutely incredible. So let's think about this epic deployment, and we've all been there. We have this monolithic application or organization. We, have, we, app, we update this application and our infrastructure twice a year. We usually pick a bank holiday weekend. Memorial Day is coming up. How many of you are doing a big upgrade to your environments next weekend? Wow, you guys get time off? I want your job. <laughs> all right. These applications are updated twice a year. We know that these updates are going to go bad. We need all hands on duck, deck. We need our subject matter experts on there. All our services are going to go offline when this happens. This is a non-repeatable event twice a year. And it's stressful, it's unreproducible, and we know it's not going to go well. This is not a good deployment situation that we want to be in. So we can and we should do better. So let's look at continuous delivery. What does that mean for us? Deployments happen often. And people ask me how often. I have customers that make deployments monthly, some daily, and some even hourly. It depends on your organization and where you are performing in the DevOps lifecycle. We want to be able to deploy on demand. We're deploying software, infrastructure, and even identity as code in small incremental changes. We have traceability. We do testing early and often. We have feedback engines. And we have historical records for traceability. So I want to talk a little bit about how Microsoft adopted a DevOps culture. Because we have, I don't know, how many people do we have in our organization? Pierre, how many people do we have in our organization? 100,000, 200,000? Thank you. We have 145,000 people at Microsoft. We made a DevOps culture change. That's a lot of people. This came about with the intro of Satya Nadella. I think we've all heard of him. He said at Microsoft, our mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. He said, we're going to adopt a growth mindset. That means we're continuously learning. We don't have a fixed mindset. Every day is a school day for me at work, and that is why I love my job because I don't have a fixed mindset, I'm continuously learning, and if I don't know something, I ask, or I research it, or I get learning time. We have a culture of customer obsession. We care about our customers, and we all have aligned, shared objectives in our teams. Before joining as a cloud advocate, I was a senior software engineer at Microsoft. So we had shared objectives when we delivered in our team. So when we deliver our products to you, now each team works as its own entity, but the Azure DevOps team the um, any product team, the, the PowerShell team, the Microsoft Teams team, the Windows team, the Xbox team, all work under these methodologies, but in their own working manner. So first thing we had to do in our engineering teams is change our definition of done. We had to assign our definition of done. In my previous role, I was aligned to a customer project for six months with the delivery. We had to say what's done. And we'd have to go back to a customer and say, I'm sorry, what's your must-haves, what's your nice-to-haves? You're probably not going to get the nice-to-haves in six months. We had to have a production-first mindset. So everything we did on the life cycle of a feature, it was ready for production from day one. That's that shift left mentality that we had to learn in our culture. We had to change how we collaborated together. We developed and delivered our code. Collaboration is the biggest part of DevOps. And it's probably the hardest part of our jobs is working with people. Because when I started working in tech, I didn't sign up to work with people. I signed up to work with technology. But I have to learn to collaborate and work with my fellow peers and you as a consumer. And we had to enhance our security from development to production. That's what it means by shifting left and doing things early and often. We also took a zero distance approach to our customers. When you just saw Jason and Jeffrey and Sydney and everyone talk about PowerShell, they're using GitHub. You can go onto GitHub, see the issues that are already open, open one of your own. You can see the feedback, the roadmap. We have direct feedback from our customers. Those product teams take that feedback and help deliver those new features. You want to see a new PowerShell feature? Get on GitHub, open an issue, and give it to the team. The engineering teams are going to see that directly. That's how they develop these new features, because you as the community give that input. In the old days of Microsoft, I used to break Exchange servers, SharePoint servers. I broke a lot of things. 
I'd call someone to get support. I'd speak to someone in a different country in a very different time zone. I was firefighting. They got me through that problem. They didn't really care about who I was or any features in the product. I'd say, you know, this product sucks. Can you fix this? They'd be like, yeah, don't care, not my job. Now we can give that direct feedback. Spend some time on Stack Overflow, GitHub. You can go directly to feedback.azure.com and give feedback directly to those product teams. Tell them the features you want to see. You can tell them it sucks. I'm saying that one. But we also had to deliver, excuse me, eliminate these unhelpful KPIs to our, to our engineering teams. We had to take quality over quantity because what I will write code in in two hours is not what you'll write code in in two hours. You might be able to write the most amazing PowerShell module in 10 minutes. I'll see you in three hours. I don't work at the same rate you work at. So we have to measure the outcomes of our employees, not our outputs. So what are these OKRs? What do these key results look like for people in the ops organization? We need a clear mission and vision statement on every single team. When I worked on the engineering teams, we would engage with a customer and we spent our time as a team. First of all, we had a team kind of motto, how we worked. We had a team working agreement and we had a clear vision and mission for every product we were deploying with our customers. So we need to look at these objectives to see what are we trying to accomplish in this mission? Like what's the point of delivering this feature and this value to our customers? So key results are gonna be the measures of these objectives. Now the common mistake is that these key results are not activities, but measures of outcome. So we have some good metrics that we use in operational teams that we like to look at. So do our customers having a growth and rate of adoption? So when we talk about that value, I can develop a feature, develop something or push out a new app or whatever. If they're not adopting it, what's the point? What's that value? If there's a change in performance, if someone starts underperforming, maybe they're just not delivering what they used to. Is there a reason for that? Personal reason, professional reason, et cetera. We also measure the change in time to learn. I'm given time to learn. How do I pick up? How do I learn these things? Do I adopt? Do I pivot when I hit a roadblock, a technical roadblock or a blocker? We also use maybe a change in frequency of incidences, which is super critical to us because we're going to have outages. There is no way around this. How many of you play Xbox? I really expected more hands. Okay. Well, I'm trying. Uh, when, when lockdown started, Xbox had outages everywhere because we were at home. What else do we do? I'm going to play Xbox. But we have live site health that our customers can see. For any of you that use Azure, same exact thing. GitHub, Azure DevOps, any of our products, Microsoft Teams, if there's an outage in the world, we are transparent. Now the question is, how quickly can you recover? So we look at time to detect when we have an outage, time to mitigate, Time to communicate to that to you as a customer. These are things we track within our teams. And how efficient is our DevOps process? So I'm gonna deploy some infrastructure. I worked for a company <laughs> years ago, uh, not Microsoft, by the way. It took us two days to deploy a virtual machine for a customer. I was a managed service provider in the UK, two days. And we had a physical tick box list. You had to do this, hand it off to the next person, tick a physical piece of paper. It was my hell. So what's our time to build? What's our time to test our code and deploy? We were able to get that two day deployment time in that company down to two hours because we started implementing infrastructure as code and better operational procedures. Now you, you just sit here for a minute and imagine, I need a virtual machine. I'm a customer, I'm paying an MSP to manage an entire environment and it takes me two days. That company's not gonna survive and we know that. So how much value? So these are great metrics to look at. We're constantly measuring and improving. DevOps doesn't stop. DevOps, when you start to adopt it, is hard. And people ask me, where do I start? Pick the thing that hurts most and start there. So when we go through that DevOps process, when we're planning, tracking, and then we have that monitoring piece, we look at our incidences. We look at how we collaborate and develop. Can we improve those things? Because we're gonna have those outages. What's our cost day to day to run this? We also had to evolve our people. So we had a lot of teams made up with engineering, program management, ops, SRE. We put them all into a feature team. I told you my job title was senior software engineer. That doesn't tell you which technology stack I work in because I didn't work in a technology stack. I, I did actually, at one point, I was on a cloud native team. We all had ops backgrounds. I'm infrastructure as code and app transformation and some cool platform as a service stuff on Azure. I had Mr. Kubernetes on my team. That was his actual real name. And we were in a great team. We were spread out across several time zones. I love this team, but we focused on the tech. So we were moved to a feature team. A, it had to be geographically located. So I got moved from a team that was based in Europe, in EMEA, to a team that was based in the UK. And we had all different people on that team. 
So we had this horizontal developer, this horizontal team, because your UI person, your API person, doesn't give a hoot about your data. I didn't care about data either, I'll be honest. But I had to become a vertical engineer because I have empathy for what my other teammates were developing. We paired up together. So how does this look in the ops world? I know a lot of teams and not in the operational space that have a networking team and a storage team. How many of you have had a storage person or networking person or specialist go on vacation? Yeah, what happens then? Yeah. So what we did is we did pair programming. Again, I didn't like data, but I had to learn about data. I had to learn about the, U, the UI, the API, all the other things that I didn't want to learn about, like machine learning. Like, I, I just, it wasn't my thing. It's not what I love. But that person can go on vacation, and I kind of had an idea, and I learned. I had a growth mindset. So I learned how to be more of a, what they call a T-shaped developer. I call myself a Swiss Army knife, right? But I need to sharpen my tools once in a while. So I do. And I learn those other parts of the stack. So I have empathy for them. So like I said, I was in a team that got moved to a UK-based team. Now, this is prior to the pandemic. Our team used to sit in, in the same room, especially here in Redmond. And they had 10 to 12 engineers, and they're self-managing. Each team had its own culture built into it. So Satya said, we're going to do all these great things as an organization. The engineering teams were there to set their own OKRs and their team charter, because we each had to make sure the team worked for us. And very often, you would move teams every 12 to 18 months to go work on a new feature team or something else that really interested you. And as an ops person, that can be really hard, because I've been learning one thing in ops for so long. Before I joined Microsoft, uh, actually before that, I focused on VMs, VMware, Hyper-V. And I, all the time, get arguments about Hyper-V versus VMware. I don't want to start that one today. So we'll avoid that. And then I found this thing called Azure. And I was scared of it, because I was like, I'm going to be out of job. What am I going to do? I learned to automate things. I learned to do things faster. And I wasn't getting calls at 3 in the morning. So I loved it. But these teams own everything from the feature, from the inception of the idea, to production, to monitoring. So when I tell you to give that feedback to the engineering team, they're going to see it. You had the coolest team in the world on stage before me telling you all the things they're giving you as a community. So give that feedback. So what are our pillars of modern operations? What do we care about? We care about operability, observability, reliability, capacity, and that's hard, change management, incident response, we get rid of that central ops team, and ops and SRE are part of every single team. Because I can tell you that the security team doesn't care about capacity. My testers QA, they don't care about capacity. They just want what they need then and there. They wanted it yesterday. So you're going to get what you measure. Don't measure what you don't want. Don't put junk into the machine. Think about your environment traceability. Your auditing and compliance is going to be absolutely critical. So you want to be able to correlate your production deployments into what you've actually deployed. Have that traceability. I'm going to talk about things like Git and pull requests in a minute, and they're scary things for us operational people. Why are they scary? Because developers use them, and as ops people, we have to adapt and we have to grow, and we have the most to learn. So for us, it's hard, and it's a scary world, because we don't want to be called developers, do we? Mm -mm. Thank you. That man does not want to be called a developer. I've, I've done that before. So we want that observability set up. We want to be able to analyze our systems, get insights into why things are happening. How many of you have to deliver against an SLA, either to your end users or other organizations? What makes up an SLA? First of all, it's your SLI, your service level indicator. That is going to be what is being measured, how it's measured, and from what perspective. Again, you're going to get what you measure. Measure well. Look at the tooling, your monitoring, et cetera. Your SLO, your service level objective, is your SLI over time. You can set a minimum, maximum, whatever works. Developers tend to work in sprints. In a lot of the teams I've worked in, we worked in a one-week cycle. And that sucked. But we did it because it lit a fire under our tails. It lit a fire under our customer. And we made sure we lived to that one-week cycle. And that was our measurement tool for our SLI. Excuse me, our SLO. So that service level agreement, when we calculate what our customers need, the 99.59 uptime, that agreement's going to cover the SLIs and SLOs, and we always face penalties for not meeting them. And if ever you, any of you have been there where you haven't met an SLA, it's painful. Having worked for various MSPs, like that's the worst customer conversation you can have. And at Microsoft, it happens to us. So as an ops person, you're going to say, I don't have time for DevOps. 
I got too much going on. I got, I'm fighting fires, my backlog's huge, don't have time. We have time thieves every single day. We got work in progress. My to-do list is taller than I am. It, and it just keeps building. I've got conflicting priorities because my organization isn't encouraging me to do these things. They want this, they want that. Then I get pulled aside from like a project team that's like, yeah, we need this like three weeks ago, but we don't have capacity. How do we adapt? How do we pivot? We have neglected work. We have unplanned work. How many of you have unplanned work? Like every day, right? If anyone's not doing anything later, I have some unplanned work we can pair up on. No? OK. It happens to all of us. But we've got to move past that. We've got to look at how we can reduce our manual intervention in production environments. We need to move those manual tasks to automation. We want to reduce that variability in everything we're doing in those manually driven workflows. We want to reduce that human error. We can use service principles. We can do all sorts of things to connect to Azure and all these great things. But then we have credential exposure. And then we're going to have someone on our tail about that. Using central secret stores, ways we can hide those secrets. And why does hiding secrets matter? Because you will get found out. Remember the cost of a breach that goes into millions? Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the company now. Capital One actually had a firewall breach several years ago. Firewall wasn't patched. It was exposed. Someone got in. It took them months to find it. Customer data was found out. Now when they got in through the firewall, guess who left plain text passwords on the servers? Good job, guys. Um, I've done it. I've been in a rush on a project, and I'm like, you know, I'm just going to put this password here. No one's going to find it. Someone will find it. People are out there, the world we live in. So we have automation to the rescue, right? We're going to look at some modern deployment practices, some things we can do. And again, this people change is hard. And if we invest in tooling, it's not going to solve all of our problems. How many of you in or your organization say have invested in a tool that didn't work? Yeah. It's more than just the tooling. But we're going to look at some tooling over tasks in a minute. We want to let the machines do the repetitive tasks while our humans build the tools to solve the problems. Whether we're using PowerShell, Golang, Bash. I want to talk about Bash. I was working on a project with a colleague not that long ago. And um, I love this colleague, one of my favorite humans on this planet. We were collaborating on something, and we're in different time zones. Okay. And we're working on a Word document. And this colleague goes, you know, let's put this Word document in SharePoint. You know, that's a great idea. Put it in SharePoint. Can't lose it. Can't screw it up. Turn on version control in the document. So any changes I made, any changes they made, we could track them. Brilliant. My colleague goes on vacation. And uh, I was like, hey, can't find that document with your changes. Oh, yeah, I made the changes. So I had to text my colleague on vacation. And I felt really bad. Um, colleague went, yeah, yeah, I saved it. Blind, I can't find it. My colleague went, Yeah, I saved it locally. <laughs> How many of you take a laptop on vacation? Get out of the room. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> you want to find me? Send a pigeon. Send a pigeon because I am not taking my laptop on vacation anymore. So we lost six weeks of work because someone didn't want to use the built in source control that we had. And that is a tough lesson. Six weeks of work. I cried. It's not the first time I've cried, but I definitely cried. So how many of you have written a PowerShell script or you've had a file and someone's overwritten it? Yeah. We often sometimes take our documents to go version 1, version 2, and save different copies so we don't overwrite them. And that's why we need to look at source control. I know we're getting into developer territory, and Mr. Roman back there hates being called a developer. But it's kind of the word we use, and I haven't thought of a new awesome word that talks about all the cool things we do. But we're going to talk about source control for a minute. So why do we need it? Because it's a form of version control. And it uses the concept of code repositories. And it uses something called Git. How many of you use Git? Thank God. Yes. Great. I'm done. I'm just going to, no. Um, But we need to be able to track these changes that we make in our repositories. Whether we're writing documents, SharePoint's not a bad place, don't get me wrong. But if we're working on a collaborative project, put it into source control. We can use cross-team collaboration. And we have this little cool tool called GitHub that Microsoft acquired. I'll talk about that in a minute. But collaboration, I want to talk about that because collaboration is key to DevOps. 
So how do we talk? How do we communicate? I am constantly working across different time zones with my colleagues. I am working asynchronously. So how does that work? Well, if I make a change, I want them to be able to see it. I can also hook in my Microsoft Teams into my GitHub. So anytime I make a change to that source code repository or my document, my colleague can see it. I can see it. And if I open up a pull request, they can see it. This is why we need to have that visibility. Another great use case for Teams, collaboration, and source control, and I'm going to just use GitHub. You can also use Azure DevOps. There's all sorts of other tools out there. Because you can update on a project. Someone opens up an issue. So let's say someone here opens up an issue for the PowerShell team. PowerShell team sees it, hooks into their GitHub, their team sees it in their Teams channel. They also communicate. Anytime they update that issue, it updates that to the Teams channel. So they can see, so you, as a, even as a consumer, can see what progress has been made. And the team can be made. So if someone is standing over my shoulder and going, yeah, I need that web server deployed, and they just kind of sit there and go, is it up yet? Is it ready? You can go, go tech the Teams channel. You're giving them that visibility to have that, that, that full view of what you're actually deploying. Gives that cross-team collaboration. So GitHub, small little you know, company that we acquired. We acquired it because we wanted to be closer to the developers, to the people that are out there. And we want to encourage open source adoption. Why does anyone care about open source adoption? Well, sharing knowledge, collaboration. We talk about this thing called developer velocity. Because we know that the most innovative companies that are having four to five times the rev revenue growth, 55% higher innovation, are using open source technologies on things like GitHub. How many of you share your PowerShell code today? It's a good number, about 50%. Many, many years ago, not that I'm going to date myself, about 15 to 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I was working for a company, and nobody would share their PowerShell code. They're like, mine. This is my domain. I'm keeping it. Not going to share it. So if I need to do a task, I had to write my own code. Now, that was part of a culture issue in that organization. But it also shows how we've changed our mentality from pet versus cattle. So when we talk about DevOps for the ops team, you know, we used to have server farms, and we'd name them. I had a great server farm. I used to live in Colorado. Um, we named them based off the mountain ranges, the 14ers. At another company in Boston, we named them off of barbecue and local breweries. That was my second favorite. But those were our pets. Like, we were really thoughtful about naming them, what we did with them. And then if they broke, we cried, and we had a really bad day. So when we start thinking the cattle mentality and infrastructure's code and continuous deployment, if something breaks, I just take it out and I rebuild it. Because everything's automated with infrastructure's code scripts, I don't have to worry about feeding and watering my pets anymore. So we all know what GitHub is, I think, all of us. Anyone not know what GitHub is? So it's, it's sharing, right? And there's really cool things for cross-team collaboration, GitHub Actions. How many of you use GitHub Actions? A couple of you. So when I talk about automation, we talk about GitHub Actions as continuous integration, continuous delivery. GitHub Actions is so much more. Why? Because you can literally automate anything. Give it a shot. Go look at it today. You can spin stuff up, automate it. There's tons of free open source tools that you can use. And it's kind of cool. You can automate little things. Maybe when someone joins your project, you send them a little message, send them a little welcome message, et cetera. And I'm going to talk about Visual Studio Code for a minute. So we saw the guys up here before doing their little demo. I used to love PowerShell ISE, like love. Anyone with me? Yeah. I now work in VS Code because ISE, it's dead. Yeah, I had to, I, again, I had to adapt, have my growth mindset and adapt new things, Visual Studio Code. So Jason, I believe it was Jason, was showing IntelliSense. How many of you have used IntelliSense? It's awesome. It has made that Visual Code experience so much better, so, so much better. I want to introduce something called GitHub Copilot. Um, I am admittedly a little behind on my blogging. I was hoping to have the blog ready for today, but I've been busy, I've been jet lagged, and I blame Pierre. Oh, he's already left the room. Okay, we're gonna blame Pierre. No, uh, GitHub Copilot, give it a shot. It will help you write your code. It's an AI programmer, it is in preview, you can sign up for it. If you can't get access, give me a shout on Twitter or LinkedIn, I will ping the GitHub team and ask, because it's great. So, we can convert our comments code. It's actually also really good for documents. We can put testing into our PowerShell code with GitHub Copilot. Testing is important. 
How many of you have used um, Pester? Awesome. And you know what? Pester has good things and bad things, et cetera. But to develop really good code, we need to test it early and often in that DevOps lifecycle. So this helps add some testing in. Uh, it will write some tests for you. Go check it out. It has actually made my life a lot easier. So I'm hoping to get a blog out on this in the next few weeks. I do apologize. Life's been a little crazy. And I'm here with you all. But uh, maybe if I get some downtime today, I might get a, get a start on it. So what does all of this mean? First of all, we want to deliver value. As an operational team, lead the way. Don't let the developers lead how you run your organization. So align your goals and your incentives in your teams. Dev and ops should have those, those ideal aligned business goals to deliver the value, not just the technical measures. Training. Give yourselves and your employees safe areas to experiment. I actually next week have a learning day. I can learn whatever I want. I have the entire day to do it. Um, I do set aside four hours every week for technical learning. It could be anything. I could look at a project. I could see a tweet about something really cool that I want to try, something completely different. Um, one thing on my to-do list is learning Rust. Why? I don't know, something cool and new. Autonomy, choose your area of focus. It's OK to make mistakes. That drives innovation. When we fail fast, we learn. It's OK to learn and make those mistakes, and even admit, you know what, I screwed up. And your tooling. Give your teams that freedom of choice at the team product level within those engineering teams, those feature teams, to find what tools work for them. So we've got a lot of resources. Um, there's a lot of resources at Microsoft. The one in the middle, Microsoft Learn. Free learning. Pierre's walked out of the room, which is a shame, because I was going to bring him up here for a moment, even though he didn't know. Um, Microsoft Learn is free learning for you and your team. My colleague Pierre and I are currently writing some new PowerShell modules. We want to get feedback from you all this week to help make those modules better for yourselves and your teams as we're trying to expand their learning. We also have the DevOps blog. The DevOps blog has featured a lot of the Azure DevOps product group, but there's a lot of cool stuff in there. We also have the IT Ops blog, um, and that's going to be expanding. And then I run the DevOps lab on Channel 9 for Microsoft. We've done a lot on infrastructure as code this year. A lot of the community requests has been bicep. Um, I actually have the Xbox team on this week, and we're talking about how they're using Bicep and DevOps and how they've changed their tooling. So there's been a lot of infrastructure as code focused. Um, we have Kyle Ruddy in the back from HashiCorp. Sorry, Kyle, I'm going to point you out because I can. Um, I've done quite a few video videos with Mr. K.M. Ruddy and his epic beard, and we talk about Terraform because I'm a massive Terraform fan. Um, I've also had Pulumi on the show. So a lot of infrastructure as code stuff, and we're getting more into the ops space of DevOps, so do check it out. So I want to thank you all for being here today and letting me pick on you all and enjoy your time. And thank you for everyone coming out and doing everything in person. So before we go, I have a tradition for in-person talks. We're going to stand up. I, we're going to stretch, right? I know. On the count of three, we're going to scream DevOps, OK? So that we literally piss off everyone in the hotel. You ready? One, two, three. DevOps! Thank you all. Have a great one.